download our IELTS preparation app and access unlimited premium practice material for your exam. Part 1 Questions 1 to 5 are based on the following conversation. Oh, hi Dave. Long time no see. Hi Maria. I just settled down. I thought I'd drop by. Come on in. Take a seat. Would you like anything to drink? I have Sprite and orange juice. Sprite would be fine. Oh, so how have you been? Oh, not bad. And you? Oh, I'm doing OK, but school has been really busy these days and I haven't had time to relax. Mm, by the way, what's your major? Hotel management. Well... What do you want to do once you graduate? Um, I haven't decided for sure, but I think I'd like to work for a hotel or travel agency in this area. How about you? Well, when I first started college, I wanted to major in French, but I realised I might have a hard time finding a job using the language, so I changed my major to computer science. With the right skills, landing a job in the computer industry shouldn't be too difficult. So, do you have a part-time job to support yourself through school? Well, fortunately for me, I received a four-year academic scholarship that pays for all of my tuition and books. Wow, that's great. Yeah, how about you? Are you working your way through school? Yeah, I work three times a week at a restaurant near campus. Oh, what do you do there? I'm a cook. How do you like your job? It's OK. The other workers are friendly and the pay isn't bad. Now you have a chance to read questions 6 to 10. Several days later, Dave and Maria met on campus. So what do you want to do tomorrow? Well, let's look at this city guide here. Um, here's something interesting. Why don't we first visit the art museum in the morning? OK, I like that idea. And um, where do you want to have lunch? How about going to an Indian restaurant? The guide recommends one downtown, a few blocks from the museum. Now that sounds great. After that, what do you think about visiting the zoo? Well, it says here that there are some very unique animals not found anywhere else. Well, to tell the truth, I'm not really interested in going there. Yeah, why don't we go shopping instead? There are supposed to be some really nice places to pick up souvenirs. No, I don't think that's a good idea. We only have a few traveller's cheques left, and I only have $50 left in cash. No problem. We can use your credit card to pay for my clothes. Oh, no. I remember the last time you used my credit card for your purchases. Oh, well. Let's take the subway down to the seashore and walk along the beach. Now, that sounds like a wonderful plan. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear part of a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the lecture and complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the space provided.
Good afternoon and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. Britain has over 700 tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports, stations, historic landmarks and towns and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says tourist information. The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries as well as provide essential maps, guides and brochures. Tourist information centres at major ports and airports in London and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the tourist information centres. Now, let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take lop coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports and central London underground stations, payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used and these come in 10, 20, 40, 100 and 200 units and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. Now you have a chance to read questions When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now let's see the banks in Britain. There are 24-hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from 9.30 to 3.30, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. National Gyro Banks has 42 bureaux de change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. Opening hours are 9 to 5.30 weekdays, 9 to 12.30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are 8 to 8 weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 to 5 on Sundays. The bureau de change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged, as these vary considerably. Wherever possible, you are advised to use the bank or Bureau de Change, which conforms to the BTA Code of Conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Dr. Simons. Now you have some time to read questions 21 to 30. Well, as I said, there were three areas of interest, so perhaps we should take each in turn. Fine. Let's take the medical and physical evidence first. Hmm. Well, 
First of all, life expectancy. Although some very old individuals were encountered, the Ramesses is a case in point. He was probably over ninety. It seemed the average Egyptian died rather young, from about thirty to thirty-five years old, on the whole. Although the nobility, as might be expected, tended to live longer, some of them have been found to be fifty or sixty years old. Well, naturally, the older they got, the more medical problems were encountered. But some modern disorders have so far not been found. There is no evidence yet of any malignant tumours, for example. Although the fact that most people studied were comparatively young could account for this. Another modern problem, dental decay, was also absent, probably due to the plain diet and absence of sugar. There was another problem with teeth caused by this diet. The stones on which their flour was ground caused a lot of grit to get into the bread. And this eroded the teeth so much that many older people must have suffered greatly and could have been confined to a liquid diet. An abscess on the jaw caused by this kind of erosion may, in fact, have contributed to the death of Ramesses II. Analysis of the internal organs of several mummies has revealed that intestinal parasites were common, even among the upper classes. Evidence of a generally low standard of public hygiene. And another widespread disorder was a form of anemia. Naturally, the ancient Egyptians didn't smoke, but、uh, lesions on the lung were widespread. These, however, are the sort that we associate today with workers in mines and quarries, and must be due, in the case of Egyptians, to living in sandy desert conditions. Actually, on the smoking issue, there was a temporary sensation when traces of what appeared to be tobacco were found in Ramesses's sarcophagus. But、uh, botanists later confirmed that it was not, in fact, tobacco itself, but a related plant which is native to Egypt. In the meantime, cynics were commenting that it probably had come from the cigarette of some careless Egyptologist or museum attendant of the past. Ha ha! And what about their physical appearance? Well, what would you expect from seeing Egyptian art? They were light and slight in build. The average height for both men and women was about one meter sixty. And、um, studies of the skeletons from which the covering of flesh can be extrapolated suggest that they weighed much less in relation to their height than most modern people, from about ten to fifteen kilograms, less than someone of a similar height today is the estimate. Now you have a chance to read questions. And what about mummification?、Uh, well, the first thing to be said is that it wasn't always done in the same way, and it was by no means infallible, as many people tend to think. Many bodies, including that of the famous King Tutankhamun, were also entirely destroyed by overuse of one or another of the substances generally employed. The basic procedure was much the same, however. Most of the internal organs, including the brain, were removed and preserved separately in a jar. The brain was got out through the nose using a sort of hook. Oh dear! Yes, it used to be thought that the heart was always removed too, but in the case of Ramesses, it was found in place. The body was then immersed in a substance called natron. That's a form of sodium carbonate, which occurred naturally in Egypt, for forty to seventy days. It was then washed, made up, and wrapped in linen bandages and placed in its coffin or sarcophagus. Then it was soaked in oils, resins, and perfumes to help preserve it further. You said the body was made up. Do you mean its face was painted? Yes, yes. Ramesses was not only made up; they had to restructure his nose, which was damaged when they took out his brain. The investigators found that it had been stuffed with small animal bones. And、uh, peppercorns of all things. His hair had been dyed too. You said that Ramesses had suffered other adventures after his death. Ah, well, yes, poor chap. 
Well, for a start, he was found in a much later tomb than his real date. Along with a lot of other pharaohs, it looks very much as if the priests of later times had moved and reburied him to save him from tomb robbers. His body was transported, along with the other pharaohs found in the same tomb, to the Cairo Museum. That was in 1871, and it was put on display. Well, naturally, removed from the dry desert atmosphere, his body started to deteriorate, and by the 1970s was in very poor state. That was part of the reason why the Egyptian authorities gave their consent for its temporary removal to Paris for study. Yet another upheaval. The French experts aimed not only to carry out an investigation, but were also able to apply the latest techniques of restoration and conservation, so that at the end of the study, Ramesses was specially treated and then rewrapped in new bandages. Well, they weren't exactly new, since they were of ancient Egyptian date given a new sarcophagus and carefully transported back to Cairo, where he is now kept in a controlled environment, which should slow down the deterioration process. So, as I said at the beginning, not only was science served, but a proper respect was paid to the remains in the end. Exactly. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by Don Parker, an expert on computer security, about the computer criminals. First, you will have some time to look at the notes below. Now listen to the talk. Hi there. As an expert on computer security, my job is to oversee and analyse the phenomenon in computer users. Computer has been commonplace in our daily life, make our life and work efficiently and lively. However, with the development of the computer technology, computer crime has come to arise more people's attention. Now, in respect of this topic, I will present some of my view and studies. What kinds of people are perpetrating most of the information technology crime? According to my research, over 80% may be employees. The rest are outside users, hackers and crackers and professional criminals. It is amazing that employees amount for this large portion. Let us see them in detail. Employees. Employees are those with the skills, the knowledge and the access to do bad things. Dishonest or disgruntled employees pose a far greater problem than most people have realised. To most supervisors and some experts, they worry that dishonest employees or outsiders can more easily intercept communications or steal company trade secrets. Workers may use information technology for personal profit or steal hardware or information to sell. They may also use it to seek revenge for real or imagined wrongs such as being passed over for promotion. Sometimes they may use the technology simply to demonstrate to themselves that they have the power over people. This may have been the case with a, a Georgia printing company employee convicted of sabotaging the firm's computer system. As files mysteriously disappeared and the system randomly crashed, other workers became so frustrated and enraged that they quit outside users. Suppliers and clients may also gain access to companies' information technology and use it to commit crime. With both, this becomes more a possibility as electronic connections, such as electronic data interchange systems, become commonplace. Hackers and crackers. What are hackers? Hackers are people who gain unauthorized access to computer or telecommunication systems for the challenge or even the principle of it. 
Crackers also gain unauthorized access to information technology, but do so for malicious purposes. Crackers attempt to break into computers and deliberately obtain information for financial gain, to shut down hardware, pirate software, or destroy data. The tolerance for hackers, as the benign explorer has decreased, most communication systems administrators view any kind of unauthorized access as a threat, and they pursue the offenders vigorously. And educators also try to point out to students that university cannot provide an education for everybody if hacking continues. Professional criminals. Members of organized crime rings don't just steal information technology; they use it in a legal way as a business tool, but for illegal purposes. For instance, databases can be used to keep track of illegal gambling debts and stolen goods. Drug dealers have used pages as link to customers. Microcomputers, scanners, and printers can be used to forge checks, immigration papers, passports, and driver's licenses. Telecommunications can be used to transfer funds illegally. As information technology crime has become more sophisticated, in 1988, after the last widespread internet break-in, the U.S. Department created the Computer Emergency Response Team, or CERT. Although it has no power to arrest or prosecute, CERT provides round-the-clock international information and security-related support services to users of the internet. Whenever it gets a report of an electronic snooper, whether on the internet or on a corporate email system, CERT stands ready to lend assistance. It counsels the party under attack, helps them thwart the intruder, and evaluates the system afterwards to protect against future break-ins. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.